Welcome to the history of socialism, past, present, future. That's the name of the course for which I've invited Professor Jeff Ely to come to speak to us. We invited Jeff Ely to come and talk to my class. The invitation was done sometime in August uh, because of this book called Forging Democracy, the History of the Left in Europe, 1850 to 2000. Uh, Jeff Ely is a historian of the left, of Germany, Britain. He's done work in historiography. He's done work on social class. He, in addition to being chair of the history department at present, he was once chair of the Department of German, Dutch, and Scandinavian Studies, correct? Yeah, it's not as, technically it's still Germanic languages and literature. Oh, okay, well. well my, my, my first goal was to actually change that stupid name. <laughs> so I but insulted you me, by... <laughs> they wouldn't let me do it. They wouldn't let you do it. So, but we used okay. it anyways for most purposes. And he's been the acting director uh, of a program founded by one of my closest friends, the Film and Video Studies program. So he's got this enormous range. Okay, that, that's imp important to say that. He's uh, written um, a number of books on German history, on uh, contemporary historiography, in a number of other fields besides the history of the left. But specifically, I wanted to invite him because of this book. It is a marvelous work of synthesis, and I don't say that lightly, a marvelous work of synthesis and interpretation, and it manages to tell the story of the left and, and more specifically, socialist parties within the left and the socialist movements, as well as feminist movements. And he tells that story for the entire sweep of its history and tells it with a liveliness that is just wonderful to read, consisting uh, every chapter beginning with a series of vignettes about people who have lived this history, why they were involved, what their experience was, uh, and it makes reading it a joy. It's living history written with, a, with passion, with attention to the personal, as well as the political, and with a sense of commitment. So it, it is, has been wonderful interacting with the book and with his work as part of this whole project of studying the history of socialism. Now, I say I first invited him in August, um, and the official title of the course, just so you know, is Socialism from the Second International to Chavez's Ven Venezuela. So it's a socialism from the deep past into the present. And after he accepted the invitation to come, something major happened. Occupy Wall Street, which suddenly shifted our whole sense of the course, of teaching about the left, of learning about the left, and I think about the kinds of things we would want to hear from Professor Ely. I lost some of my best students in that class to Occupy Detroit, and I'm happy to say that, uh, and, and in, fact, in fact, proud to say that, uh, because it, the, what's been happening in this city and nationally and internationally is a movement the likes of which I think no one has ever seen. When has there been a truly global movement uh, arising at the same time with a similar ethos, a similar sense of objectives? You could go back to the New Left or 1968, but something about this has spread to more places and involved certainly arguably, arguably more people. So the 
course that I'm teaching turns out to be absolutely timely, and the invitation to Jeff Ely turns out to be absolutely timely. Uh, I'll just read a couple of words from the very beginning of the book where he sets out what he's going to be talking about. By the last third of the 19th century, socialists were challenging political definitions of democracy with a new question. How can genuine democracy be achieved in a society fundamentally structured by class inequalities of ownership, distribution, and control? On this basis, the main features of socialist economic policy became hotly debated. Cooperation, public ownership, and the socializing of production, industrial democracy, and planned direction of the economy. But of course, as most socialist governments have found, any attempt to democratize the economy in the name of such policies encounters all manner of vested interests with privileged access to political, bureaucratic, and ideological power. In practice, democratic goals can only ever be pursued against the resistance of dominant social groups. And precisely in the last six weeks, what we've seen is a response to that protracted resistance of the dominant groups, a movement that has, is evolving. We don't know where it's going to go. And there is no better person, no better qualified person, to tell us today about how to make sense of what's happening today in terms of the history of what came before. So, I give you your charge, <laughs> Jeff Ely. Accordingly, I, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to introduce Jeff Ely to talk to us about the past, present, and perhaps future of the left. Thank you. Um, no, thanks enormously for that uh, generous introduction. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, and um, uh, um, uh, very appreciative of, of the invitation and everybody's willingness to come out. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something about the context in which I came to to want to write this book and uh, and um, some of the purposes that uh, were motivating me, and then I'll try and draw some distinctions between the his you know the history that the book um, um, tries to capture and uh, the new conditions of possibility for thinking about the left. Uh, in the period since the 1990s. So I'll begin uh, by saying something about the general aims and, and background of this book. Although it was conceived in, in, in the middle of the 1980s, I, I didn't start the writing of the book uh, until uh, the 90s, when the left in Europe was certainly on the defensive and experiencing a serious crisis of uh, disorientation and existential disarray as well as a, di a disastrous loss of popular credibility inside the dominant political cultures of the continent. The collapse of actually existing socialisms between uh, 1989 and 1991 opened a period in which democratic goods came to be identified only with the most limited forms of parliamentary liberalism and electoralist politics. Still worse, the very possibilities of democracy, the very possibilities of democracy became tied in the most reductive way to the dogma of a market society. And in the process, the understanding of how democracy can be achieved became broken apart, split off from the popular struggles that in the past have always been needed for the winning of democratic gains in Europe or anywhere else. So. At a time when Europe's citizens were being asked to think of democracy in ever more narrow ways, I wanted to uh, try and reconnect democracy's histories to the much larger visions of popular participation, active citizenship, 
and radical social change that have always been inseparable from democracy's most decisive gains. I wanted to bring the history of democracy back to the history of the left. I wanted to help reclaim for the left some of the political ground lost during the dramatic social and political changes of the last quarter of the 20th century. Now, in terms of my own uh, sort of um, story, so to speak, my own biography, my own standpoint, uh, there were perhaps three elements that went into the starting point for the book, which I'm now going to describe. So first, um, I was, you know, and I talk about this in the in the introduction, in the preface to the book. Actually, I mean, uh, first, I I was very definitely a child of the post nineteen forty five welfare state. I was born in nineteen forty nine, uh, and my cultural outlook, understanding of the good society, and political expectations, sense of a desire of desirable and possible futures were all uh, powerfully shaped by the political settlement put into place during the years 1943 to 1947. Now, at one level, that political settlement was based on Keynesianism, economic planning, uh, and the pursuit of full employment. Vitally, it also included the institutional strength of the trade union movement inside legally secured national systems of industrial relations, combined with the accepted necessity of public goods guaranteed through the welfare state and what seemed to be an expanding commitment to civil liberties under the law. Now that post-war system of politics uh, should not be idealized. I'm not trying to, you know, kind of construct a, a lost golden age in that sense. That post-war system of politics shouldn't be idealized but it did seem to provide a basis for further advances. It definitely owed a lot to the left's decisive political influence in the 1940s and after, and it seemed to promise new opportunities for the future. Yet by the 1980s, when I started to write this book, uh, those bases were heavily under attack and all but falling apart. So one of the aims of my book was to ask the question, what kind of structure held the previous politics together? What kind of structure had been necessary in order to hold that previous politics together? And what allowed it to be dismantled uh, so comprehensively? So what held that post-war system of politics together and what allowed it to be dismantled so comprehensively? So that was the first you know, first piece of, uh, of uh, my sort of personal motivation, personal investment in writing this book. Secondly, if one of my reference points was 1945, another equally important one was 1968. So this is a book of a completely unapologetic 1968er. Uh, I wanted to hold, I wanted to uphold the positive importance of what happened in 1968, and I'm obviously saying 1968 for, you know, I mean, the, the long 1968 is actually 1965 to 1973 uh, or so, it seems to me, 73, 75. Um, I wanted to uphold the positive importance of what happened in 1968 and the immediate surrounding conjuncture. On the one hand, this meant the new political issues raised by the events of 1968, especially feminism, uh, direct democracy and participatory forms, the critique of the state, the critique of bureaucracy, critique of alienation, critique of the family, the politics of sexuality, the personal is political, um, advocacy of social movements as against the older model of the party <laughs> and new forms of internationalism. That seems to me to be a good inventory of the kind of uh, issues that the events of the late 1960s placed on the agenda in quite new and often spectacular ways. 
On the other hand, this also meant um, a strong field of conflict. It meant the disavowal of the two main established models of the socialist left, uh, Western social democracy and Soviet-style actually existing socialism. So in that sense, the Prague Spring was just as vital to the identity of this new left as the May events in Paris. So that's the second thing. And I'm obviously doing this in a very you know, summary kind of way. Th third, my third purpose was, was, was more strictly historiographical. I wanted to sort through the implications of the huge amounts of social history produced during the 1970s and 1980s for the left's sense of its own past, especially the remarkable upsurge of social histories of the working class and the histories of women. How do those new histories, or how did those new histories, challenge uh, and change our perceptions of the earlier history of left traditions. And in this sense, for instance, my book was avowedly a feminist rewrite, rewriting of the left's history. That's one of its most important purposes. One of the most important dimensions of what I wanted to do with this book is to go back to the history of the tradition and ask the question, what does it look like in the light of everything we've learned through the fem new feminisms of the 1970s?